Okay, well, hello, everyone. We're very happy you're here today. This is our first in a long series of webcasts, webinars uh, to help with implementation of our college career and civic life C3 framework for social studies state standards. This is part of the C3 literacy collaborative that we are operating in collaboration with the National Center for Literacy Education, and we are just thrilled and very honored to have this funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. <clears throat> Excuse me, my name's Michelle Herzog. I'm president this year of National Council for the Social Studies, and I also work as the consultant for history social studies at the Los Angeles County Office of Education. So I'm happy to be here and to lead you through this, this very first one in a series. So let me tell you a little bit about background, the goal of the C3 Literacy Collaborative. It is to create and operationalize plans designed spe specifically for social studies teachers to implement the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts. We know that the Common Core is a shared responsibility across all disciplines, and so we have created these series of investigations and webinars to help all our social studies teachers in the field achieve that goal. So like I said, this is the introductory overview webinar of the C3 framework designed for educators. We're glad so many of you have joined us today. And please know, of course, this will be archived and be available for later use. It's just an overview. There'll be others that'll go more in depth. But really, hopefully, at the end of this one, you'll be fami become familiar with the background of the C3, the process that was used to create it, some of the rationale for why we put it together, the goal and purpose of it, the design of the four dimensions and the inquiry arc, and hopefully you'll be able to discuss the connections to the Common Core state standards. So we're going to start with a short video clip. <clears throat> this is a part of an hour-long uh, webinar that was produced here at LA County Office of Ed and also can be accessed from National Council for Social Studies. So let's show you a little bit of this to give you just a little overview of what the framework's about, the audience, and the overarching goals and objectives. Take a moment to watch. My name is Michelle Herzog. I'm the History Social Science Consultant for the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and I am so very excited to welcome you to this very special webcast to introduce you to the College, Career, and Civic Life C3 Framework for Social Studies State Standards. You know, we are all very familiar with the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts and Mathematics, and now the Next Generation Science Standards. What those documents are doing to change the face of education for English language arts, math and science, this new C3 framework is going to change the face of education for social studies in very much the same ways. But before we go any further, let me explain that you, our live viewers, will have an opportunity to ask some questions at the end of the show by typing them into the chat box on the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to respond to them at the end of our broadcast. So keep that in mind as we go through. Let me now um, begin by explaining that the C3 framework is really designed to serve two audiences. For states to use to upgrade their state social studies standards, and for practitioners at the local school district level in schools, teachers, curriculum writers, they can use this document to strengthen their social studies programs. And the objectives of the, of the framework are simple. One, to enhance the rigor of the social studies disciplines, an important piece. Second, to build critical thinking, problem solving, and participatory schools to become engaged citizens. And finally, to help align academic programs to the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts in Literary, his, Literacy and History Social Studies a lot of the work that we're doing in schools. So it brings us to the ultimate goal, which is simple, for students to study civics, economics, geography, and history to become active and engaged citizens in the 21st century. OK, so you saw that, that for a little bit. Let's take a minute and answer this question right here. 
So think about this for a minute. Are the goals and objectives of the C3 framework similar or different than the goals for social studies in your school or district? Jot down some ideas if you could in that chat box. Hopefully you can see that on your screen. We'll be able to share those ideas. Boy, that's great. We're seeing that this is a common purpose for, for several folks in their districts. Interesting. So we, this is going to be a useful piece, to be sure. Okay, let me hide this one for now, and let's see if we can move on a little bit. Um, as we know, collaboration was really important in the development of the C3 framework. And I'd like to show you a little clip, too, of Kathy Swan, who is the project director and lead writer. She was also part of that one-hour webcast that you just saw the intro for. But I'd like to hear, let you hear from her words about the importance of the collaboration that took place when we came to develop this. Because sometimes the credits are just as important as the final product. Collaboration was really the key to the success of the C-Theory project. When this work began, um, it faced many challenges, um, including the widely held belief that a common set of anything in social studies was virtually impossible. If the past is any kind of predictor, agreement among a diverse group of social studies educators seemed at best unlikely and at worst disastrous. Um, but on the other hand, in order for this document to be ultimately successful, we really needed that kind of buy-in from a, um, a very diverse set of researchers, policy makers, and practitioners. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is um, as add on to what Susan painted as the beginnings of the project and how it developed over the course of three years. So as, as Susan was saying, um, you know, the, at the time that the Common Core um, came out, I think um, there was a, a bit of a tremor that went through um, the social studies world. And it certainly rocked the professional organizations um, that Susan uh, was working with, but it was also rocking, in a way, the, the, the state education agencies, um, particularly the social studies consultants um, in those agencies, wondering if um, social studies was going to be left behind or if the common core was going to become the de facto standards for history and social science. And so um, I had the opportunity and have been working with a group of state education agencies in um, as a collaborative inside CCSSO called the Social Studies Assessment Curriculum and Instruction Collaborative. Um, these 23 states, along with Los Angeles County um, uh, Office of Education and the University of Delaware, were having similar conversations that, um, that Susan was having, which was, what are we going to do about social studies? Is there going to be a big organization um, that steps up and, and kind of champions the work? Um, and we waited, and we waited, and um, it didn't look like that was going to happen. And so um, ultimately, what SASE and the task force um, decided to do is that uh, it's to work together uh, to build a document that would frame social studies for this next generation. So as Susan said, um, there were 15 professional organizations that at this point uh, began working with SASE under the SASE umbrella. Um, and we, we called them the task force, um, uh, the task force for um, social studies state standards. Um, and these states and these professional organizations worked together over about 12 months um, time uh, and, and really tried to hash out, is a common set of anything possible? And if it is possible, on what foundation will it stand? Are there certain agreements from the very beginning that would direct a, a group of writers um, to develop um, what would become the framework. And, and in fact, 
We didn't do it in a day. Um, it took about a year um, of just really um, kind of methodically going through the history of social studies, how it had been traditionally characterized, and thinking about the way it should be characterized, um, drawing on documents that were really strong in the past and documents that we, um, that we hope to create in the future. Okay, so two couple questions. And John, I'd love to know your ideas about this. What do you notice about the various contributors to this work? And how do you think this collaboration impacted it? Take a look at those lists of folks and share your thoughts with us. <laughs> the who's who of social studies. I agree with that. I don't know if there's a social studies teacher anywhere who wouldn't recognize some of those people and groups. <laughs> I like this comment. I think it must have been crazy hard to reach consensus, but the product was worth their pain. <laughs> I have to say I was involved in a lot of it, and it really was quite a process. Very passionate, heated conversations throughout. But I think that the real, the real gem here is what we came out with, and people learned that if we didn't work together to create something, we were really going to hurt our individual disciplines and, of course, social studies as a whole. So it really was quite a social experiment as well, but really, I think, very powerful experience. I think most would agree, too. What's nice, too, is now that the document is published, we're able to call on these different organizations, and they've been really supportive and helpful in, in helping with the implementation effort. Many of them have have gone forth and aligned their curriculum materials to the C3. They're referencing it in their professional development um, because our goal was just to capture really good social studies practice. And we had the experts there in the room and all along the way. So it was really quite a fabulous, fabulous experience for everyone. So I appreciate your input here. All right, so let me hide these for now and go on with our discussion. Um, and let's, let me give you a quick overview of the inquiry arc. Um, it really is framing social studies around four dimensions as an inquiry-based approach, approach to the subject. You know Common Core, if you're familiar with that, I'm sure most of you are. And even the next generation science standards are really moving to an inquiry-based approach to education. And so in alignment with that, so is the C3, a very in inquisitive approach. So let me take you through the four dimensions quickly. And we can learn more, of course, at another time. The first dimension in the C3 is about developing questions and planning inquiries. The idea that we want kids to get excited about social studies. And so to begin each unit with a question, what we call a compelling question. Something is, that they say has got some intellectual meat to it, but is really going to excite kids and want them to learn more. Um, and then, of course, beyond asking a compelling question, you hopefully are urging kids to follow up with some supportive questions. And that's really powerful, too, because we've already started and we're modeling the whole importance of, of questioning and then starting to think about finding sources to those answers. That leads us to dimension two, where you want to dig into the content. And so I got to go and dig into content to find answers to my very compelling and supporting questions. And this was an interesting development, developing this dimension, too, because there was a lot of discussion on content itself. How do we maintain the um, disciplinary integrity of civics, economics, history, and geography? Um, how, do, how deep, how detailed should this content be in this dimension, knowing that different states have different grain size? Some states are local control when it comes to standards and content. And so I think the, the overarching view was to kind of frame these as high-level um, conceptions. And when you dig into dimension two in your C3 framework, you'll see that. The idea is that states that have state social studies standards can link that to these concepts. They, they very much complement each other and to move forward. So when people sometimes will say, well, there's no real content or beef in C3, that's anything but the truth because go to dimension three, look at those content concepts ideas, you could certainly uh, bring in a, a lot of important content that we know kids need to know. 
And of course, the humanities are a big part of that too um, in that discussion. So that leads us to dimension three, and I know most social studies people are familiar with this one. We love to look at multiple sources. We love to look at multiple points of view. And we want to train kids to be discerning with the information they receive, to analyze it, look at it carefully, gather and evaluate it, because we want them to show evidence when supporting a claim and developing claims. This is pretty familiar, for I think, for most social studies teachers. <clears throat> the last dimension is, of course, communicating that conclusion. Most teachers know how to do that really well, whether it's doing a presentation or writing an essay or explaining something, but the last part is the exciting part for us because we want kids to apply what they've learned in the real world, all right? So all the lessons of the past will remain in the past if there's not some opportunity for young people to either to apply the ideas, the content, the concepts to the real world. You know, when we have kids studying issues around immigration or economics or genocides or any of these events that have happened over the past, we want them to learn from the past. And so to be informed as citizens, to be effective and be making good decisions, you want to draw on that past experience and of course all the skills you've developed to come to that. Um, the goal of this, as you know, is to prepare students to be active, engaged citizens. So we need to help them practice, use the knowledge they gain, analyze it, and apply it to really inform public policy, to know who to vote for in elections, to know how to write to their Congress people if they see a problem and they want to see it, um, they want to see it addressed. So all of these things combined, we hope we'll do that. Let me let you listen to the expert. This is S.G. Grant, um, professor and dean at the Graduate School of Education in Binghamton, one of the chief architects, and he describes the importance of that inquiry arc beautifully to another one of our C3 rock stars. This is Dr. S.G. Grant. He is professor and dean of the Graduate School of Education at Binghamton University. Dr. Grant worked closely with the team as the architect mm -hmm. for the conceptual design of the document. Um, S.G., we just heard Kathy talk about the inquiry arc and the four dimensions. Can you drill down a little bit for us uh, to explain what these concepts and approaches really mean to the social studies teacher in the field? I'd be happy to, Michelle. Good evening to you and to, to Susan. I'm thrilled to be with you all tonight. I actually want to begin with a quote by Jerome Bruner from his book, The Process of Education. He said, we begin with a hypothesis that any subject can be taught effectively in some intellectually honest form to any child at any stage of development. Now, we didn't include that quote in the, in the framework. We probably should have because the spirit of it really infuses the entire document. Um, it's a big challenge to think that we could teach any idea to any child, but in fact, that's what we're all about. And I think the, in, in lots of ways, the, uh, the inquiry arc kind of encapsulates what Bruner was talking about. It's a set of... Uh, interlocking, mutually supportive ideas that really kind of highlight the intersection of teachers, learners, and ideas. And I want to come back to that point a little bit later. But let me talk a little bit more specifically about the, uh, the actual dimensions of the inquiry arc. Those four dimensions are, one, uh, developing questions and planning inquiries. Two, applying disciplinary concepts and tools. Three, evaluating sources and using evidence, and four, communicating conclusions and taking informed action. You know, in lots of ways, social studies at its heart is really about understanding why people do the things they do. Some of those things are noble and ambitious and brave, and some of those things are cowardly and silly and naive, mm -hmm. but they all make up the fabric of social life. And so, in some ways, everything that people do and say and think is fair game for social studies. That, of course, gives us this incredible terrain uh, of material to work with. And that can be a great thing, but it can also be an intimidating thing. And so the inquiry arc, I think, in lots of ways, helps us make some decisions about how to approach um, teaching units and, and lessons. So a bit about each one of the, uh, 
the, the dimensions. First of all, this developing questions and planning inquiries is really designed to, to front load the notion that social studies is about inquiry. It's about the questions that teachers and students create, bring to class, and then spend time thinking through. But you can't just uh, spend all of your day asking questions. Um, and so you need to start thinking about what are some of the ideas that we already know about the topics that those questions are based on. So the second dimension is really about this notion of identifying and applying the disciplinary concepts and tools. Now, in some cases, the questions that students and teachers have will be focused on a single discipline. A question like, um, what are you going to use your money for, lunch or a video game? Sounds like an economics question. Whereas other kinds of questions, and I would argue that, frankly, most questions probably are more interdisciplinary mm -hmm. in nature. So a question like, should we uh, continue building transcontinental oil pipelines has an economic focus to it, but it also has a real important political, social, and uh, geographical dimension to it as well. So these ideas uh, of discipline, knowledge, and skills, and concepts, and tools is really critical. But again, that, that's not where we end. We start with questions. We look at what we know. But then we take it to the third dimension, and that is evaluating sources and using evidence. Because in the end, we want kids to be able to do something with the ideas and the questions that they have. And we all know uh, from the internet, the internet has certainly exposed the idea that mm -hmm. there are all kinds of sources of information, but they are not always of equal value and use. So helping kids understand not only that there are multiple sources of information, but how to um, evaluate those sources and select from them the ones that are most useful is really a key skill. But then again, we have to take it one step further and apply that evidence. We have to use evidence to create explanations for social phenomenon. And we have to use evidence to create arguments that will persuade others, hopefully will persuade others, of the ideas that we hold in mind. The fourth dimension then of the inquiry arc really focuses on what you do once you've formed explanations and arguments. And that's the idea of communicating our conclusions and taking informed action. As teachers, we all know that there are lots of ways that kids can express their ideas and, and go back and forth with them. But we haven't always been very good about allowing kids the, the many different ways of expressing their ideas and the idea that kids can express those ideas in lots of different venues. Mm. Kids can talk about their ideas in classrooms, but they can also talk about them in school, in communities, and, and a whole range of other kinds of, of uh, opportunities that we oftentimes uh, limit ourselves from exploring. I also want to say, kind of echo the point that Kathy was making, that this document in some ways really pushes, pushes uh, the envelope in terms of where we draw the line about what makes an effective citizen. And for too often, we've been content with kids who can recite information that we've handed down to them. And what we really need to do is start thinking about the ways that kids can really express their ideas in more and varied kinds of, of, uh, of venues, as I said. So this notion that taking informed action does not mean the kids have to go out and, and pick it, every idea that they don't like. It means something as simple as writing an essay and trying to persuade their partner with them that they've got a new way of thinking about an idea. That's informed action just as much as, as any other sort of idea. Like as I said, he says it so well, and I hope you got a good sense of that, of the overview and the importance of the inquiry arc. I want you to take a minute to think about these questions and why you think there's so much emphasis on inquiry in the C3. Why were we so deliberate about that? And listen, of course, based on the comments we heard from SG and what you know about it so far. And I'd also love to get your input to know how, how you think questioning by teachers and questioning by students themselves helps prepare young people for college, career, and civic life. We put up some things here where we can uh, give you some space to share your ideas.
go ahead and give us your thoughts. I know you do a lot of questions in your classrooms. We'd love to know more how you think it really helps with the teaching and learning of social studies. Like that, one of our participants puts students at the center of the learning. You know, we hear a lot about the importance of engaging young people in school, getting them interested in what they learn. And we know from a lot of the dropout research, that's a big reason for keeping them in school, too. Active learning, true learning, terrific. Essential for deeper understanding. I sure agree with this one. Trains for self-efficacy, needed for all aspects of life. Boy, if you're a parent yourself, you sure would like to see some of those skills. You know that front and center about having kids in your, in your home, ask questions, but also be able to know where to find them as well. Yeah, lifelong learning, critical thinking, all of that. You know, I think back to when I was in high school and middle school, we called it junior high then, learning social studies. The only time we really had a chance to ask questions was maybe at the last five minutes of the period. Would have been a lot more interesting if we had been engaged in that from the beginning. Sounds like you guys get that too. And of course, we all know there's a difference between good questions and not so good questions, but that's a whole art form in itself. So modeling that, getting kids to engage in that, really cool stuff. That's one of the big goals we want, because you know when we're preparing kids for civic life, we want them to be able to do that. All right, so let me hide these questions for now and move on a little bit in our, in our overview. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit because, as I mentioned earlier on, the goal of this project is to really help social studies teachers make those connections to Common Core. And we had a big discussion about that in the development of the Common Core of the C3. Should we go there? Should we not go there? Because we even know now, as we anticipated, that even though there's 43 states that have adopted Common Core, there's others that haven't. But I got to believe that all 50 states and districts and territories surely want their young people to know how to read, write, listen, and speak effectively in academic circles. So I believe that even if they haven't adopted Common Core, these are goals that are common for all states, for all classrooms. And we did make the deliberate decision to make those discrete, those uh, intentional connections to the Common Core. John Lee really led this effort. So let me give you a few minutes to listen to his perspective on the whole information and the need and importance of connecting to the Common Core. Thank you, Michelle. Glad to be here. Um, the, the publication of the Common Core was really a watershed moment for us in social studies, uh, given that it came on the heels of 10 years of no child left behind, which resulted in significant marginalization in social studies, particularly in the loss of instructional time for elementary grades. The Common Core was a new challenge for social studies. Um, by incorporating social studies as a part of the shared literacy responsibility in grades K-5 and actually listing standards in grades K-6 for history social studies, as Kathy said, some people wondered out loud whether social studies was just being folded into English language arts. Well, a funny thing happened on the road to social studies demise. Turns out the ELA Common Core got it right. Uh, you know, the document sets forth a clear and rigorous set of standards for literacy in all the grades and in, in all the areas, uh, content areas, particularly in social studies for us. And they function as a foundation for us to do the more ambitious work that we want to do in social studies, namely to prepare young people for civic life. So what does the Common Core expect of social studies and how are we to build on that foundation in the C3 framework? First, and probably most importantly, the Common Core establishes a set of basic disciplinary skills that include the ability to cite textual evidence, the capacity to understand disciplinary vocabulary, the ability to distinguish among fact, opinion, and reason judgment, being able to distinguish competing or alternative claims, and the capacity to narrate historical events. In addition, the Common Core emphasizes research and anchor standard, uh, writing standard seven, and communication and speaking and listening standard six. The Common Core goes so far as to even emphasize democratic discourse, something, of course, we're pretty good at in social studies. Um, in speaking and listening standard 1B for grades 11, 12, it even says that students will work with their peers to promote civil democratic discussions and decision making. 
So what we did when we developed the C3 framework was use a three-part strategy to make connections between the ELA Common Core and the C3 framework. We took care to make the connections to all 36 anchor standards in the Common Core and did that in three ways. First, the C3 framework has been constructed in such a way as to incorporate in its entirety the ELA Common Core. So as you examine and implement the C3 in uh, the various uh, districts and systems in California, you'll see traces of all 36 Common Core anchor standards. Um, and you'll see that these uh, standards are not only um, present, but they're emphasized in unique ways. Um, but again, we see all 36 of these standards as being foundational to social studies. Second, we think that some of the anchor standards are particularly supportive of the inquiry aims of the C3 framework. Specifically, reading at all of the reading anchor standards, actually, 1 through 10, writing standard 1 and standard 7 and 9, as well as speaking and listening standards 1 through 6 and language standards uh, 6. Now, the third thing that you're going to see in the in the uh, C3 framework is that we have emphasized a small number of Common Core anchor standards that we see as absolutely vital to inquiry in social studies, specifically reading standard one, which is about citing evidence, writing standard seven, which is about research, and speaking and listening standard one, which is about participating in conversations with diverse partners. So the C3 framework connects to the ELA Common Core in addition by using shared language. We use terms such as argumentation, evidence, sources, discourse, um, and we're doing this to replicate and complement what the Common Core has done. Uh, you're also going to find numerous graphical and narrative explanations for how the connections work out across the disciplines. Given this, the nice foundation that the Common Core provides us for literacy learning, the C3 framework aims to expand on the notion of literacy by setting forth two kinds of literacies. First, inquiry literacies. Um, we have these specific inquiry literacies that play out in dimensions one, three, and four. Things such as questioning, as uh, SG talked about, gathering information, using evidence, communicating conclusions, and taking informed action. But in addition, we focus on specific disciplinary literacies. These include, in history, using deliberative processes, um, excuse me, in civics, using deliberative processes, participating in school settings and following rules, um, in economics, making economic decisions, using economic data and identifying prices in the market, in geography, constructing maps, using geographic data and classifying historical sources, and in uh, history, classifying historical sources, determining the purposes of an historical source, and analyzing cause and effect. We think that the most effective and meaningful way for social studies educators to implement the ELA Common Core is through the C3 framework. As we like to say, it's literacy through the social studies. So I hope this explanation of the connections between the ELA Common Core and the C3 framework has been useful, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, I'll let me pull up to some uh, uh, a new, another poll question I'd like for you to contemplate since you were just listening to John Lee. A couple questions. So let's take a minute, pause right here to think about this whole common core idea. Let's see if we can respond to this question as you were listening to Dr. Lee. What did you see as the key connections he made? What resonated with you? Mm. There's someone wrote in, they think that uh, the C3 builds on the foundation of the Common Core State Standards. I would agree. You know, if you're going to read informational text, what better place to do it, of course, than in social studies. I guess science, too, but you know, you know we're biased. Writing integration, citing evidence, aren't we the perfect discipline for that? I think we are. It gives a great context for meeting those standards. And it's good news for us. You know, we've just come out of an era of No Child Left Behind and, and other state initiatives where many people felt our subject was marginalized. This is a great opportunity to provide that context for developing reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills for all. Yeah, someone here said it best, an authentic platform to practice reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Couldn't have said it better. That's just, that's just great. I just hope you can message that and help your colleagues to see that. Because I know at your school when they're saying, are you doing Common Core, hopefully from this and maybe other webinars and resources, you'll be able to articulate that really clearly for them, too. So 
Okay, so let's move on a little bit. We just, and we just responded to those questions. And anyway, I'm just going to finish up pretty soon. Like I said, this was just a very brief uh, overview. We really do, we are in the process of creating many, many more of these webinars. And you know there's a great, all kinds of places at socialstudies.org slash C3 to find more. But here's what we have in, in the works right now. Other webinars and investigation topics for teachers across the nation that are going to be available at no cost. We love that. So we're very soon going to have a similar webinar, not for educators, but for the general public that will speak to the business community, um, community members, other organizations, parents. We'll talk a little bit on another one of these webinars on the instructional shifts, because for many teachers, teaching social studies in this way will be a shift. For others, not so much. So as you start to contemplate this new way of teaching, what part of it is new, not so new? Is there something you're doing you can maybe stretch a little further? So we're going to go into a little more depth on that. Of course, then we have separate webinars and, and investigations coming up that are going to dive deep into the separately into the four dimensions and really spend some quality time and some practice contemplating sharing ideas. We're going to go a little deeper, of course, in the connections to the Common Core State Standards in grades K through 5. Our elementary people are really a great audience. And you know, elementary folks, don't shine them on. They really understand teaching and learning and have to teach all the subjects. So helping them blur those lines and create meaningful instruction is really powerful. And they set the stage for all of you who teach middle school and high school. So they do excellent work. Um, other things, how does the C3 align to Common Core? We're going to dive deep into a, a, some pieces on reading informational text, argumentative writing, speaking and listening, and you won't believe some of the folks that we have lined up to develop and present these webinars, they're just absolutely top, top, top in the field. We're going to, of course, spend some time on a webinar, an investigation, talking about authentic assessment, give you tools for developing your own C3 lessons. We're also in the works. We're working with um, our National Social Studies Supervisors Association and uh, one of our associated groups, and we're working with them to create a webinar on tips and tools for school administrators. Want, certainly want them on board and understanding what this is about. A couple of those. Something for coaches, if many of you are instructional coaches, so we're excited about that. And our own CS4, which is our associated NCSS associated group of states, departments of education, social studies leads are working on something for us to inform state policies and practices. And of course, let's start at the beginning. We're creating something too very special for our methods teachers. So lots of work coming up. Check us regularly. You'll see as these start to roll out um, and move forward. Your one-stop shop, of course, socialstudies.org slash C3. This is where the C3 framework lives, where it resides, where it was published. And we are treating this as a centerpiece for all things C3, and you'll find links on there to lots of other resources, including our C3 teachers, um, other state collaborative work, lots of things going on. So it's changing almost daily, so please keep track of that um, as, you, as you move forward in your own individual work. Okay, well, there, I'd like to finish up with a very short video. It's a five minute, thanks to Social Studies School Service who funded this. Because people always say, okay, we get the overview. What does it look like in the classroom? So this is a five-minute snapshot um, that we're hoping we can get up and show you. And it's a fifth-grade classroom. And many of you will recognize the teacher, Rebecca Waubana. I see she's one of our participants today. She's probably hiding under the desk right now. But she's a fantastic teacher, and now she's a teacher leader at Glendora Unified. So um, I'd love for you to take a look at this. and just kind of get caught up in the excitement of what this looks like for fifth graders. Okay, so we're uploading some more. We're still in progress. I think we still have our chat room up. Um, any questions, meanwhile, please insert some questions there. Let us know what, you, what you're doing in your area around the C3 framework. We know there's lots of pockets of activity going on all over the world, and all over the nation, of course. Ah, I knew this, Mary Ellen Daniels. Fantastic teacher. She, I can't believe she has time to watch this today. 
because Illinois is in the process of updating their state standards for social studies, and Mary Ellen's at the center of that, and they're using the C3 as a foundation. We're very excited about that. We also know that uh, Connecticut, not too long ago, just updated and approved a new state framework, and it's all C3 all the time. That's an exciting piece. And let's see, SD, South Dakota, is that right? Just revise state standards and utilize the C3. Oh, wonderful, South Dakota. We'll have to get a link to that. We'd love to see what that looks like. We know Kentucky's doing a lot of work, Hawaii is. I'm in the state of California. We haven't had any formal adoption, but I gotta tell you, there's a lot of folks up and down the state who are excited to be using this. Ah, Connecticut rolling out their frameworks with a series of PD. We've been hearing all about that from Steve Armstrong and John Tully, another great model. So it's, it's all very, very exciting. Here's someone who says it reminds them of the exp expeditionary learning, obviously. You know, I can see a lot of project-based learning too in this too. Most teachers really all they need is permission to let her go. So very, very exciting. Anything else that folks are doing? Okay, I think we're getting close to uh, showing you our big finish here. College, career, and civic life C3 framework for social studies state standards was a collaborative effort over three years. It included social studies teachers from across the nation, heads of social studies at state departments of education, institutes of higher education, and a number of social studies professional organizations who all lent their expertise and excitement for increasing the rigor and relevance of social studies for students across America. We all know how it's important to prepare kids for college and career. We also believe that social studies is the subject best suited to prepare them to be effective citizens in the 21st century. The lesson you're about to see, led by Rebecca Valbuena at Glendora School District, will show you what it looks like in the classroom for fifth grade students as they develop their understanding of constitutional principles and apply it in the real world to prepare them to be engaged citizens in the 21st century. We're going to be doing some reading today, so I would like you to take out the Constitution book from your book basket. The series of lessons is designed to help students investigate um, the importance of civic involvement and that they understand their role as citizens now and into adulthood. Throughout the lessons, they learn how and why people participate in the democratic process. They study the fundamental principles of the Constitution and how the Constitution changed over time. One of the biggest goals of the series is that students can describe a government that is by the people, a government in which citizens exercise their power by voting. We do have rights, and our rights are won, and it's voting that protects those rights. So having the power to vote is part of living in a democracy. The ultimate goal is that students are involved now and that they continue to be involved into adulthood. In a perfect world, I'd want them to register to vote the second they turn 18 and exercise that right to vote into adulthood. Dimension one begins with a question, an inquiry. We want students to get excited about learning social studies. And so we start with what we call a compelling question. Today's compelling question will ask students why is it important to vote, and does it really matter? The idea is to get them excited about learning their subject. Voting matters because your voice can be heard, and you can make decisions based on how you feel and your opinions. Dimension two is about applying disciplinary tools and concepts, not just looking through the lens of history, or economics, or geography, or civics, or the other humanities, but looking at them in interrelated ways and also connecting to reading language arts. Dimension three is about evaluating sources and gathering evidence to respond to the compelling question. Our data. So Gavin, would you go ahead and explain the data to us? Um, in the age range 18 to 25, we had eight people say that uh, voting does matter and six people say that it doesn't matter. The fourth and final dimension, probably the most exciting, is communicating conclusions and taking informed action. 
to get out in the world and really make a difference. I want you to exercise your right to vote. They wanted to help solve the societal problem that they discovered for themselves. They were able to conclude that, yes, voting does matter. They didn't really understand why, if people were registered to vote, that they didn't go out and vote. This idea of voter apathy came into play. And we decided as a class that we could do something about it. When you can dig deeply into the curriculum and students have a voice and it's driven by their questions, that we are able to make it more meaningful and fun. And when learning's meaningful and fun and motivating, it's successful. Whether your state has adopted the C3 framework or not, we hope you can utilize this document as a framework for increasing the rigor and relevance of social studies, making it exciting and engaging for your students, and sharing with them skills and ideas for taking real action in the real world. Our goal is to create an engaged, informed citizenry, and providing opportunities for students to do that. This framework allows you to take the work that you're doing and try to enhance it in ways that can build those civic skills, knowledge, and dispositions. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Don't you wish you taught fifth grade again? <laughs> we had a lot of fun filming it, and I know Rebecca enjoyed uh, creating that with her lessons. Um, and we're hoping to have more snapshots to show. Don't let me forget to mention, too, and I thank you for Linda for reminding me, New York is out in front and creating a huge toolkit of materials. And that stuff, those materials should be ready, uh, I, I believe, in June. So that's why you got to keep watching that socialstudies.org slash C3 because we'll have links to all of that as well. Anyway, I know this was very short, only about an hour, um, but I want to thank you for starting your quest, your journey with C3. I know a lot of you have already, but I hope this webinar gave you just kind of an, over, an overview of kind of the goals, the objectives, the rationale, and sort of the the intent and format of the C3. We hope that you'll be able to participate in many more of our webinars and teacher investigations, all funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We're very grateful to them. I'm also grateful, of course, to NCSS staff and Anna Post, who is the project director to this, for this, and Kalani Dunsmore and Laura Hebert, all our friends at National Center for Literacy Education. This is a huge endeavor, and no one person can do it alone. So anyway, stay in touch, keep informed, and let us know what you're doing with the C3 framework as well, so that together we can all work to prepare the next generation for college, career, and of course, civic life. Thank you. <laughs>